composition of molecular monolayers after we finish uh, our discussion of block copolymers, which we started last time. Uh, I've just repeated the announcements that uh, I had last time in the, your peer review. Hopefully you will be done by Friday. And also please sign up for a meeting with me if you can at either of these times. If not, just please let me know and I'll try to arrange an alternate time. Also, uh, I've heard from a, a few of you that you uh, don't have a team uh, and you're looking for a team uh, for the project. And uh, do your best to try to self-assemble. Uh, I put a place where you can list your name uh, as if you're looking for a team uh, in the uh, spreadsheet link there for signing up for the meetings and you know contact other people who have similar may have similar ideas uh, if something isn't working out please let me know and I'll do what I, I will can I can to uh, help uh, put you together uh, and last uh, I will be out of town next Wednesday and uh, as a result there will be a no lecture on April 7 uh, so we will have lecture next Monday and then the following Monday and uh, there'll be a bit of a change to the final lecture schedule which uh, I will figure out uh, before uh, Monday the 12th. <clears throat> so we started last uh, lecture by talking about uh, self-assembly and solution, our first uh, approach to self-assembly and solution, uh, considering uh, just the basic thermodynamics of molecules aggregating into clusters. And this was uh, kept at a pretty you know, uh, general and, and somewhat vague level, but we wanted to convey the idea that the energetics of aggregation and interaction between the components determine the distribution of structures that will uh, assemble. And uh, you can drive assembly by changing the concentration of a monomers or precursor you have in solution, so the number of uh, you know, little individual structures. And we considered that these can uh, be uh, more particular or uh, special types of, uh, of molecules than we thought about in the case of nanoparticle synthesis. In fact, uh, by chemistry, those molecules can be designed so they have different characteristics at uh, different ends. For example, a hydrophilic uh, group at one end and a hydrophobic group at another end. And that amphiphilic molecule will be a key building block for our discussion today. And in fact, the design of amphiphilic molecules uh, is very useful in the assembly of single monolayers because you use those specific interactions to assemble with a surface. And then going through the basic therm thermodynamics and considering how this, uh, if you will, aggregation energy or average chemical potential varied uh, with the size of the aggregate, we saw that in cases where there is a specific preferred size due to those interactions and due to also other effects such as how the molecules pack together and their flexibility and so on, in some cases we see that there is a preferred aggregation about a particular mean size. And then we concluded talking about the idea of a critical concentration upon which you uh, favorably form aggregates of this desired size, but you no longer have additional increasing concentration of your precursor or your monomer in solution. And then we jump to uh, introducing the idea of uh, what are called block copolymers or uh, assembled chains of polymers, multiple polymer molecules, uh, you know, they can have widely different chemistries where the basic idea is to uh, have uh, different blocks that are compatible with like blocks and incompatible with the other blocks and that can drive uh, thermodynamically phase segregation and in fact very beautifully ordered self-assembly uh, of these uh, architectures. And then we saw that based on the energetics of the interaction between these molecules, it's possible in general to form many different uh, phases. Uh, and this was an example of a simple uh, dye block copolymer with equal uh, chain lengths of A and B in each molecule and equal interaction energies per uh, unit length. And by, uh, in, in you know, computational space, varying the interaction energy uh, between the segments, the magnitude of that, and varying the mixture, uh, the fraction of the uh, A piece versus the uh, B piece in the, uh, the, the block copolymer, where the nominal case of them being equal is here, uh, you saw that uh, all these different phases could be realized, and uh, they, in fact, agreed fairly well with experiments. So we're not getting into the exact thermodynamics and energetics of how uh, these different phases are discriminated, but it can be uh, derived from calculations of the energetic characteristics of the different molecules and how they interact. <clears throat> 
but rather we'll f start to talk about a few examples of how this assembly is practical for self-organization of ordered structures and the use of these films as templates for things like production of nanoparticles, nanotubes, and nanowires. And here is just, you know, by way of example, uh, a scanning electron microscope picture of one of the uh, kind of typical gyroid phases that might form if you had uh, a dye block uh, copolymer uh, in that uh, gyroid, gyroid forming regime. So you can see here that uh, although this is a, a periodic structure, it's a uniform structure, uh, you can get very intricate uh, phase segregation and this corresponds you know, to how the different polymer blocks will segregate. These, this color, the white color, would be one of the blocks and the absence of color would be another block. And based on the you know, periodic interactions, this is the kind of phase geometry that results. And it's just an example of one of you know, many types of organizations but can just uh, create this beautiful periodicity. And you know, these feature sizes, so we're looking at like 50 nanometers here. So on a plane, this could be made by current methods of very advanced lithography. Uh, and, and if the polymer were photosensitive, you could pattern it this way and so on. Uh, but a unique aspect of this is the way it self-organizes and also, uh, incidentally, the ability to form this you know, kind of more complex three-dimensional network. So you may not have absolute freedom on how to design you know, this pattern, but understanding these energetics might let you be able to vary, for example, the pitch of these helices and their spacing. Uh, and so on. And it's just a different approach to getting this three-dimensional self-organization that if it could be scaled could lead you know, to uh, fairly quick and efficient assembly. And if we take this idea of formation of an ordered network, an ordered template, and think only in two dimensions, we return to the picture that was introduced in the context of mixing top-down and bottom-up assembly, which is using a lithographically patterned uh, template to uh, interface with these self-organizing structures. So in the general case of you know, film deposition, uh, we might realize the, uh, the, the object on the left there where we might just you know, say deposit a crystalline film uh, in this trench or etch the trench to produce a piece of crystalline material. But we could also, for example, prepare a solution of block copolymers or block copolymer uh, my cells and then uh, and then deposit it perhaps just by spin coating of that solution and see uh, not only the ability to uh, selectively arrange it in this trench but see the effect of the geometric confinement of the trench uh, made by lithography on the organization because you know the molecules might feel this trench as if it's a, an additional constraint you know they don't know if it's another set of molecules or if it's a trench or whatever and uh, other particles, as we'll start to see in Monday's lecture, could also be organized by this means. But if you think of, of, of using this approach to organize a block copolymer film that has you know, this uh, morphology where you have, say, rod-like columns inside a surrounding matrix, uh, some, an example of how that has been realized is uh, shown at the bottom here, where uh, what these researchers did is they fabricated by uh, e-beam lithography, so in the sub-100 nanometer size range, trenches of different widths, and then assembled uh, a, one of these block of polymer mixtures uh, uh, in these trenches. So by uh, depositing the mixture over the substrate, they were able to show that the, uh, they can get this organized assembly of the uh, bicomponent system inside the trenches. And the plot on the right here is showing the number of rows of this uh, organized two-dimensional lattice as a function of the uh, width of the channel. And here they have it in units of the confinement width, which is just proportional to the native width of one of these dots determined by the characteristics of the, of the polymer. But what they see is that, uh, that the system transitions abruptly from you know, one discrete number of rows to another. In other words, if you have uh, a, a channel that has a width in between the best fit width for three rows and two rows, you don't get, you know, say, extra, uh, extra micelles hanging out, in, you know, as if they want to form half of an extra row, but you get this discrete transition between uh, one, you know, uh, one fixed number of rows to another fixed number of rows and so on. And another 
example of how these films can be used. This is from a different study than the previous one, but it's the same principle of organizing uh, a block of polymer layer and using it to do another process, except now we're not necessarily in a trench, but now we're just in, a, in an area, a larger area, where we get this uh, relatively ordered lattice. And here, uh, what demonstration is shown here is the use of the uh, micellar layer as an etch mask to eventually produce uh, nanoscale dots of cobalt, which are useful for magnetic storage or for storage of, uh, you know, for, for storage of data using uh, magnetic media. And uh, I've listed just uh, the same information that's in these uh, figures up here with the small text of how the process proceeds. And uh, it can, it, these uh, block of polymer layers can be designed so you have two polymers, right? One that is essentially these domes and one that is the space in between. And you can, it can be designed so, well, the, say, the, the one that's the spaces in between can be etched uh, relatively selectively, say, by a plasma or by a solvent, while leaving the dot piece there. And so what they do is they self-assemble the block of polymer layer and then etch it so the, the, the polymer in between the dots goes away and then use this, these polymer dots as an etch mask for an underlying silicon dioxide layer. Uh, and all these layers are deposited before they assemble the block of polymer. And then because the chemistry necessary to etch metals is much more aggressive than the chemistry or less diverse ne necessary to etch oxides, they then transfer the pattern established by the polymer, the block of polymer assembly, to the oxide layer, and then they use the oxide layer as a mask for etching of the underlying metals. And then they remove the oxide and remove the tungsten, and then they end up with these cobalt dots at the bottom. And you know, it's not an exact kind of one-to-one -one correspondence, but you can you know, generally see uh, how the uh, density and size of these eventual dots in the metal film relates to the density and size of the original dots in the, uh, in, in the starting block of polymer mask. And we have a scale of, I guess, about 200 nanometers here. So these dots are uh, maybe 20 or 30 nanometers in size. So that's a pretty good uh, result given their shape and given their distribution. And now, as another example, we can pick up on uh, what was shown before in the use of the self-assembled micelles consisting of block copolymers to uh, template nanoparticles, which can then be used as catalysts, for example, for growing nanotubes. So a different approach to creating, using block copolymers to create an array of metal nanoparticles on a substrate is just what we saw before, uh, where uh, we use the tendency of these uh, copolymers to form micelles in solution and, uh, to then load metal salt into them and then create these kind of metal containing cages and then spin coat these uh, micellar cages onto a substrate and take advantage of the ability to self-organize the uh, block of polymer micelles into ordered lattices to then create uh, ordered arrays of metal particles that aren't you know, don't come from etching using the block of polymer as an etch mask on the previous slide, but come from using this amount of metal that's been stored inside during the solution-based assembly process. And uh, what is done is after, you know, in, in a more realistic schematic, after you've taken the substrate and spun on the micelle layer containing the iron salt, you really have these little nanoscale piles of polymer with the metal held inside. And then exposing that to a plasma treatment, uh, in this case just an oxygen plasma, uh, uh, one can remove the polymer fairly effectively and leave the metal behind because the metal will not be etched by the plasma nearly as aggressively as the, as the polymer will be etched. And this is then an image uh, taken by doing this assembly and etching process on a silicon nitride TEM grid, so just a thin membrane of silicon nitride that can be purchased commercially. Uh, and there we can see uh, the array of metal particles that result from uh, removal of the polymer uh, by this process. And now they are, uh, in fact, about 10 to 20 nanometers across and spaced by maybe 50 nanometers or so. And so the general idea of this process is that if you can control the, the block lengths in the polymer, you can then have a means of controlling the packing density of this film on your substrate. 
And if you control the size of that inner cage in the micelle and or the concentration of metal salt that you load into the micelle, then you change the particle size. And it turns out that works within uh, a specific range given the, uh, the, 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 the details of the polymers and the loading process. But within that range, it's possible to independently specify the diameter of the particles and their spacing on the substrate. And uh, in one study, this was useful for uh, controlling the density of catalysts used for carbon nanotube growth. And I think I showed this slide when we were talking about nanotubes and nanowires. But I hope now the picture is more complete of how uh, this final result was reached and how uh, changing these conditions in the preparation process would let one go from, say, a fairly low, lower density of particles, uh, 6 times 10 to the 9, or 6 billion particles per square centimeter, up to 60 billion particles per square centimeter. And in this case, the particles were uh, all the same size. So uh, they were just manipulating the size of the uh, outer part of the cage for the spin coating. And therefore, uh, that, would go that was governing the spacing. And then it was also possible by uh, good characterization of the particle size to compare the size of the nanotubes to the particles. And it turned out in this case that the average size of the carbon nanotubes was uh, about 12 nanometers compared to 60 nanometers for the particles, which is a, a typical result. The, the, the diameter of the structure will be you know, within a few tens of percent uh, of the diameter of the particle, depending on how the particle interacts with the substrate and other factors. So in general, these block of polymer films can be used as templates for doing a variety of things. And, and I wish we had time to talk about another examples, but this schematic just kind of shows this idea of uh, an approach to use the, 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 the template uh, from one of these block copolymer layers to, for example, produce membranes, if you could then transfer it to a porous layer with very well-defined holes, to do what was seen when we etched the cobalt film to produce patterned media that might be useful for magnetic storage. Uh, also, for example, to use the, uh, the, the features that are templated for organized growth of things like nanowires and nanotubes. And if one achieved a very highly ordered uh, film of vertical nanowires or nanotubes, that might indeed have interesting photonic properties governing from the size of the nanostructures and also the uniformity in their spacing. And one could also take the nanowires from this process and, say, disperse them and deposit them and make some transistor devices. And there have been many demonstrations all in this regard. And the last example I want to show before we move on is uh, a recent paper that I thought was pretty cool uh, that uh, demonstrated the ability to make the same kind of self-organized uh, assemblies of block copolymers, uh, but do it on the surface of single wall nanotubes. So here they took a, 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 a dye block molecule consisting of polyethylene and polyethylene oxide. And this group had, in fact, studied how polyethylene oxide itself, without the polyethylene on the end, uh, crystallized and organized on nanotubes in the past. And they used this knowledge to develop an understanding of how to get this formation of these self-stratified layers on individual nanotubes. So what you see here is a schematic of the single wall nanotube running down the center. Maybe that's a couple nanometers in diameter. And the stripes that uh, range as, as the block of polymer forms on the surface. And uh, here is what they showed, uh, in fact, happens as they increase the concentration of the polymer molecule in the solution. So this is done in a solution where they have the nanotubes in a solvent, and then they have the polymer in there. And because of the favorable interactions between the polymer and the nanotubes, it wants to essentially nucleate and grow on the surface of the nanotubes. And in an analogous way to what we're going to discuss today uh, regarding monolayer assembly, uh, well, you know, what we also had a, in terms of aggregation, there's uh, adsorption and desorption. So there's an equilibrium where you always have molecules coming in and going out. Uh, and if you increase the concentration of the solution, then you end up with a greater coverage of these, uh, you could say, you know, layers or little uh, crystals on the surface of the nanotubes. And so going from a low 
concentration to a higher concentration ends up with full, pretty full coverage of the uh, organized block copolymer on the surface of the nanotubes. And the picture on the previous slide was just a low magnification of one of these cases where they had uh, chosen the concentration to give this pretty full coverage. And they describe in the paper how it really is kind of like a nucleation and growth. At certain sites on the nanotube, you start forming uh, the, the nucleus. And then afterward, the, the additional polymer molecules kind of assemble themselves uh, with, uh, with you know, respect to this starting position. And there's adsorption and desorption and probably migration along the surface of the tube. And at the lim in the limiting case, when the concentration is too high, they uh, mentioned that because there are so many molecules trying to arrive at the surface of the nanotube, there's not enough time for them to organize well enough, and you end up with some small areas that are ordered and other areas that are disordered. Did you have a question? Does the reality of the tube have any effect? Uh, I imagine it does, but they didn't, they didn't study that. Uh, I think it could be very interesting to do this study with chirally separated tubes. I think they would probably, you know, uh, in general, uh, it would have an effect with some molecules and not other molecules. I think the work that uh, has, was done uh, by DuPont uh, several years ago on DNA interactions with nanotubes of different chirality suggests that would, would, would be quite possible. <clears throat> and in spite of, you know, this thing of change in the concentration, change in the packing, it's the inherent characteristics of uh, these blocks that dictate the periodicity of the layers, and uh, they quantified the period as being uh, fairly monodispersed, so about 12 nanometers with a standard deviation of about one uh, nanometer. And the last demonstration they did was, you know, toward an application, uh, they could also now uh, functionalize gold nanoparticles, so the gold nanoparticles would interact with the yellow part of the assembly here, and then we're able to attach gold nanoparticles to specific domains, and then you end up with uh, these superstructures that are single wall nanotubes with the stratified polymer layers where you've uh, attached gold nanoparticles selectively at the locations of only one of the polymers. And you can see here it's not perfect. You know, some have three, some have two, some have more. There are some extra particles hanging out, but certainly as seen in the, in the close-up magnification, the concept was demonstrated, and there's basically no gold in the spaces where you have the polymer that doesn't have affinity to the functionalized particle. And there's you know, much more work on creating more complex architectures, and it's pretty interesting that jump the odd and uh, funny geometries that can be achieved just based on this thermodynamic equilibrium. And of course, as you create longer molecules or use different numbers of molecules, it's possible to achieve a fairly complex order. And incidentally, there's also been a lot of work, and there is a lot of work on understanding these kind of interpenetrating and 3D morphologies for things like energy transport and solar cells and electrochemical storage. And the general idea that if you want to have some energetic process happening between two materials or two electrodes, it's of interest to understand how to make those electrodes interpenetrate to achieve uh, a lot of interfacial area and the right type of you know, molecular and physical contact to get the device to work right. Uh, and block of polymers are one uh, material and approach that's used as a kind of Lego in those sorts of processes. So finishing up this lets us move on to discussion of the self-assembly of monolayers. And we went kind of a different from a different approach in assembly of clusters or spherical things to uh, assembly of those clusters on surfaces by block of polymer self-assembly. And now we're going to take, uh, in the rest of today's lecture, a different perspective and think about now assembling monolayers or single layers and then later multilayers of individual amphiphilic molecules on substrates. So each of these rods is meant to be a molecule that self-organizes due to the uh, characteristics of interactions and the uh, the chemistry of the system into a self-assembled monolayer. And that will let us build some knowledge to then, uh, on Monday, start talking about three-dimensional assembly via multi-layers and via crystal formation. And just as we had for the processes of aggregation and solution, this will also be a re re reversible process where the uh, growth of a highly ordered layer doesn't happen instantly, 
nor does it happen by formation of a very highly ordered nucleus and then perfect docking of all the subsequent molecules. There is you know, adjustment and correction of errors as the molecules assemble, and that is essential to achieving highly ordered systems. <clears throat> so we're going to define uh, a monolayer, as you might guess, as a single two-dimensional layer of molecules on a surface. And in that sense, it doesn't matter if our molecules are big or small, but a monolayer is a single layer. And that's actually the definition taken from the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And if we want to say, like, dimensionally, what our preferred bound between you know, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, I'll say that, uh, that I like to think a two, of a two-dimensional layer as something that has maybe less than 10 nanometers thickness. So if it's a film or if it's a you know, if it's a, if an assembly of molecules, something in that size range would be generally two-dimensional, and beyond that would be thinking of things that have also some architecture in the third dimension. And depending on the size of these molecules, uh, a typical monolayer might be anywhere from a half a nanometer to a few nanometers thick, and, and, and we'll see how the chains can get fairly long based on their chemistry and, and also their characteristics, such as the angle of the molecules with respect to the substrate and the spacing between the head groups that's dictated by all these chemical interaction and size issues that uh, you can see are probably at work here. <clears throat> so then formally today we're going to address two topics. First we'll talk about formation of these self-assembled monolayers. And then we'll talk about deposition of self-assembled monolayers by a particular method that was invented actually maybe over 100 years ago called the langmuir blodgett method. Uh, and that's a way to get highly organized monolayers on substrates by first organizing the molecules on the surface of a liquid solution. So the uh, papers that I've posted, uh, one is from a company called Assemblon that sells amphiphilic molecules for the purpose of preparation of self-assembled monolayers. Uh, and their website's pretty cool if you wanted to look at their molecules. Uh, it's called The General Introduction to Self-Assembled Monolayers. And then the second is a recent paper that talks about langmuir blodgett assembly of graphene oxide. Uh, we'll see some examples from this later in the lecture, but I think it's a really nice paper in that it takes the uh, material we're going to discuss and applies it to observations of how graphene behaves as a monolayer and how it's deposited, and also talks about the balance between the uh, van der Waals interactions and electrostatic repulsion on functionalized graphene in this particular case. And then there are a couple of just extras for reference. There's a fairly long paper by Ullman, uh, which is actually from way back in 1996, on uh, the chemistry of self-assembled monolayers and their formation. And then, uh, uh, just for interest, there's the original paper in 1935 that Blodgett wrote when she was working, I think, at uh, AT&T uh, Bell Labs, uh, developing uh, this process for uh, putting monolayers on a surface uh, by what became known as the langmuir blodgett method. So the general process for forming a self-assembled monolayer uh, is to take a solution that contains the molecules you want uh, to assemble on the surface, to put your substrate in the surface, in the solution, and then wait for a while. And then after you've waited for a long, long enough time for the molecule to assemble on your substrate, you take it out and, and, and you know, wow, if you've done everything right, you've, you've formed uh, a self-assembled monolayer on the surface. And you can see that this requires some special considerations and has special architecture depending on the conditions. Uh, but you know, in general, what we're doing is we're applying our knowledge about amphiphilic molecules, basically the ability to engineer a molecule that has a head group that interacts favorably with the substrate and a tail group that doesn't interact favorably with the substrate. And by the characteristics of these interactions, this monolayer will form versus time on the surface. And we'll see some details about the kinetics in a few minutes. But we can see from this diagram that you know, in order to form a highly ordered monolayer, i.e. one that has uh, well stacked columns, if that's what you want, then uh, you got to consider a bunch of things. For example, the interactions between the groups at the, uh, the head or the tail and the head, I guess head here is referring to the one that touches the substrate, of the consecutive molecules. Uh, the intermolecular interactions between 
the, the chains themselves, like there are, there are van der Waals forces and other intermolecular forces between the chains, and also the interactions between the head groups and the surface. And the relative strengths of those interactions dictate uh, what uh, order appears. But you know, in, in general, one of the real goals uh, in doing this process is you know, relative to films that are deposited physically, for example, a film of metal that's evaporated or a film of you know, polymer that's, that's precipitated onto a surface, uh, the approach to this molecular design has the ability to give very highly ordered uh, layers. And by controlling the characteristics of these different groups, you can control the structure of the layers. Uh, on the flip side, uh, it is not applicable to all materials, like you're not going to you know, have metal molecules here. These are typically with organic molecules, but then one can use the chemistry of attachment between organic molecules and other materials to, for example, put uh, metal nanoparticles or quantum dots or nanotubes or anything you can work with, for example, on the surface of this layer. And we'll consider uh, two types of interactions between our molecules and the substrate. And just by definition, uh, we'll refer to chemisorption and physisorption. And basically, chemisorption means the molecule forms a strong interaction with the surface because it actually chemically bonds. And in the case of physisorption, there's no chemical bond, but the molecule is attaching or uh, staying at the substrate because of van der Waals forces and possibly other intermolecular interactions. And the difference between the two is kind of a trade-off, because if uh, you have a chemical bond and a chemical interaction, then you could say the adhesion between your molecule and the substrate is going to be very strong. But also, in the assembly process, the reversibility is lower, because the activation energy to reverse a chemical bond and then reform it is much higher. And therefore, the conditions for forming a highly ordered chemisorbed monolayer will be different than ones for forming a physisorbed monolayer. And in the case of a non-bonded monolayer, then the adhesion of the layer to the surface would be weaker, but you'd be able to take advantage of more reversibility in letting the monolayer uh, anneal itself under the, the, the formation conditions to form a highly ordered structure. And this is kind of more of a dynamic process in kinetic equilibrium, and this is one that is less reversible and kind of the molecules come down and stick if the bond forms upon contact. <clears throat> And so uh, a real core of this topic and of the effectiveness of this technique is the design of the molecules to be amphiphilic. So for example, uh, like we've said on all, all along, a classic example is the use of uh, a molecule that has a hydrophilic group at one end and has a hydrophobic tail. So because this is, looks like a head, we'll call this the head. And we'll call this you know, whole bit the tail. I guess in some cases you might have a separate group here which is specifically more hydrophobic, but if this is the general case of just a long hydrocarbon chain, uh, then this would all be a hydrophobic tail. And the hydrophilic thing, something that has the OH group, would want to you know, associate itself with, uh, with water molecules, hence it's hydrophilic. <clears throat> and one of the uh, most classic and versatile examples of self-assembled molecules or self-assembled monolayers is assembling uh, specific amphiphilic molecules onto gold. And uh, these molecules are called alkane thiols, uh, called uh, alkane thiols because they have an alkane chain, basically just a hydrocarbon backbone, so one that's hydrophobic. And then they have a terminal uh, group that has uh, a sulfur on it, and it turns out that sulfur bonds very strongly to gold, interacts very strongly to gold. So it's very straightforward to assemble uh, this monolayer on gold due to the interaction between sulfur and gold. And then another aspect of this is uh, by changing the head group, then you can decide what other thing you can interact with the self-assembled monolayer. So you can take the generic chemistry of a gold surface and one specific linker that s assembles well onto the gold surface, and then use this as kind of a, you know, a bracket uh, uh, to attach another molecule that will then interact with something else in a more versatile fashion. And I think this came from the company, and, and what a lot of their business is selling different alkane thiols that are used for particular chemistries, which then 
derivatize themselves for attachment to a gold surface. And this has been, uh, you could say, you know, exp the, the, the interest in this has really exploded with things like nanoparticle chemistries because now gold nanoparticles can be used as anchors for a lot of different molecules and characteristics of the gold nanoparticles, particularly their plasmon resonance, can be used as sensors. So if you have a chemical uh, assembly that is attached to this gold particle and then you can detect the presence of the gold particle, for example, optically, that's a versatile tool that can be used for a lot of different things. And in, in, in general, uh, the configuration between the molecules and the surface is going to be a balance between a number of characteristics, particularly the uh, uh, strength at which the, uh, the tail group here bonds with the surface and the uh, strength of interaction between the chains. And that can determine how ordered the layer is and how it forms. And one uh, uh, classic example of that is how these long chain molecules, in this case it's meant to represent a fatty acid molecule uh, that has a uh, negatively charged oxygen at the end, would interact differently on different surfaces. And this comes from Ullman's paper and he talks about how uh, if you have, for example, a silver oxide surface versus an aluminum oxide surface, the uh, coordination of the substrate interacts with the head group differently. And this is kind of looks like a you know, a, a, a branched, a Y junction at the bottom. And just like you would think of this, you know, physically sitting on the table, if it's only going to bond with one molecule, then uh, the monolayer forms in this vertically organized fashion. But if it bonds with both of these molecules, then in this case the molecules tilt and you form this tilted layer. You could say if, there, you had, if you had some way to really you know, crank up the interactions between the chains so they really wanted to be parallel in this fashion, then maybe one could overcome this tendency for the molecule to flip over. But it's this, these two cases of the balance between the chain-chain interactions and the interactions with the substrate that on these two different surfaces give different characteristics of the uh, monolayer. <clears throat> and Another particularly uh, widely used example of uh, uh, self-assembled monolayers is the formation of monolayers on uh, semiconductor surfaces. And for example, the use of molecules with uh, siloxane groups on the end will bond very strongly, for example, to silicon or silicon oxide or uh, other types of semiconductors. And this is a case where you get very strong bonds, but uh, the interaction is, uh, is, is, is not very reversible. So you might form small, very ordered domains, but uh, will not form monolayers with very strong long range order. Unless, for example, the conditions were very slow, so the crystals nucleated very slowly. Um, when crystals, I'm talking about the domains of the monolayer, and it formed things very slowly and carefully rather than bombarding the substrate with the molecules that are going to attach. <clears throat> so if we think for a moment about the kinetics of how these monolayers assemble, uh, as in a general picture, what goes on uh, when the substrate is inside the beaker here, you know, thinking this is meant to represent the gold substrate, here are amphiphiles, and here's the walls of the beaker, uh, there's this process by which you go from having a few molecules in contact to the surface to having a very highly ordered monolayer, which by the uh, adsorption and desorption has essentially annealed itself. Certainly, you don't very quickly form such a highly ordered structure. And by working back from the end, knowing that these interactions with the chains are important uh, between chains, if there are no chains to support a certain molecule, it's going to be more prone to flopping around and maybe laying down for a while on the surface. So, in one general picture of how a monolayer self-assembles, uh, we're going one, two, three, four, like this. Uh, first, when the substrate is submerged, if we think of these molecules as rods, uh, the, in the first case, uh, some molecules stick, and uh, some stick this way, and some start laying down, and they're generally moving around a bit and leaving and coming in. And over time, if the probability of the molecules sticking is greater than them leaving, then they kind of start crowding and push, pushing each other out of the way. And maybe one comes in and you know kind of wants to get its 
get its tail down next to this one and kind of because this 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 one of the ends is not reacting strongly it might kind of start to pry it up from the surface and then over time you start seeing formation of these kind of standing uh, groups or standing highly ordered domains and then if this process proceeds over the substrate it's very analogous to nucleation and growth as we as we thought of before uh, and eventually, if the conditions are correct, you end up with a fairly well-ordered monolayer that has a, a high fraction of, uh, of, of molecules that are standing in the appropriate configuration. And, and, and certainly in this case, you would say that because the sides of the chains have a favorable interaction, uh, uh, more so with one another than with the substrate, then if the molecules come in in the right place, it's favorable for these to stand up and be happier when they're standing all together. And this picture is not perfect over the whole substrate. You end up with fairly larger, uh, you know, depending on the conditions, could be 100 nanometers, could be bigger, could be less, uh, domains where you have the molecules standing in a well-packed fashion. And then just like you would see a grain boundary in a crystal, there's a, a boundary, and then you would have another domain. And we'll see a picture of that later. <coughs> and uh, this table just shows an example of some of the chemistries that are used to associate with different uh, surfaces. In the cases of gold, there's often you know, bonding of uh, a, 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 a formation of a sulfide bond to gold. And in the cases of glass and silica, often siloxanes are used. And you, know, you could go down the table and just like uh, you, know, you saw for chemical etching, uh, there's a lot of literature that can tell you standard chemistries that are used to functionalize different surfaces with different monolayers. And this, in fact, is very useful for if you have a microfabricated device and want to attach, say, you know, form a layer of nanoparticles on the surface, uh, you know, it may not be good enough to just kind of spin coat them and hope they stick there. If you have a self-assembled layer on the surface that has a good interaction with particles and say those are gold nanoparticles, you could functionalize your, your starting substrate with a self-assembled model that has that thiol head group and is sticking up. And then if you put gold nanoparticles on the surface, you can use this, this self-assembled monolayer interaction to bond the gold particles to the top of the monolayer. And these chemistries are you know, fairly well documented and becoming even more documented also with relevance to biological things in addition to uh, more physical things. <clears throat> so there is one little. Uh, bit of kinetics that I want to go over. And uh, this just talks basically about how the monolayers form and how they absorb on the surface. And this is called the Langmuir isotherm. And it's been around for a while. And it makes some very simplifying assumptions uh, between uh, of the system. But if we, for example, imagine that our substrate is a kind of grid of, of, of docking places for molecules. So say our substrate can be broken out, broken down into all these little sites. And you know, a molecule will fit in one site. So we'll call this an you know, absorption site. Say it fits one molecule at a time. And for example, if we're looking at, say, alkane thiols on gold, then we would have a molecule, uh, say a chemical equation that would be represented by a reaction between, this is our amplophile. And the R is the, you know, the whatever the alkane chain, the chain of alkyl groups. And then the SH is just our sulfur with the hydrogen on it. And then when these molecules uh, interact with the surface, because uh, these are going to actually bond with the surface, we would end up with. Uh, So the release of hydrogen, because the sulfur loses its hydrogen here, and then the bonding of the alkane thiol minus the hydrogen to the gold. 
and what we're going to do from now on isn't going to specifically relate to this chemistry, but that's a, a picture of the kind of exchange that happens in a general interaction. So now if we step back a second and we say that we have some, you know, molecule A that's coming in, and say it docks in this place, then it'll have some interaction with the surface. So say between A and the surface. So then we kind of have a reaction from A to an interaction between A and the surface. And like we had for formation of my cells in solution, we'll say there's some rate of the molecules absorbing to the surface and a rate that they desorb from the surface. So, and this is essentially in, in a leak equilibrium with the solution. So, if we make some definitions here that we say theta is the percentage or the fraction of the sites on the surface that are occupied. And if we say that C is our concentration of A, you know, our, I guess our monomer or our amplifier in the solution. And if we say that n naught is the maximum number sites that can be occupied, we can then write a simple equation that just uh, lets us predict the rate of change in theta, the coverage versus time. So then we can say that d theta dt is just equal to the rate of rate absorption minus the rate of desorption. And at steady state, d theta dt would be equal to zero. Uh, but if you put your solution in the, your substrate in the solution, then d theta dt is going to be positive because it's going to increase. So, based on the terms we defined before, we could say that the rate of absorption is equal to the rate constant for that forward reaction multiplied by the concentration in solution divided by the number of sites that can be occupied because theta is a fraction multiplied by 1 minus theta, because out of the total number of sites that are available, n, if theta are already occupied, then you're not going to be able to put a molecule on a site that's already occupied. <coughs> and then you can also say that the rate of desorption then is just kd divided by the number of sites multiplied by theta, because if theta fraction are occupied, then uh, all of those have the opportunity to be deoccupied at any particular point in time. So here, if this is our substrate, then this represents the molecules coming down, and this represents the molecules going away. So we're not going to solve this equation. It can be solved as a simple differential equation just by separating the variables. Uh, but if we solved it for the relationship uh, theta versus t, we would get a general expression that you have uh, a form like so. Theta is equal to a constant a multiplied by the quantity 1 to the e to the minus another constant b multiplied by time. And then a and b depend on uh, kA, kD, and the concentration. But we would see that versus time, we would approach 
sum steady value where the initial rate is proportional to the rate of absorption and over time you reach a steady a steady coverage that is related to the final balance or the time at which the adsorption and desorption balance and this theory would tell you this and in actuality if you're able to monitor the adsorption of molecules on the surface you would see that you know maybe if you had a really precise measurement there might be some oscillation or some fluctuation uh, of course because of measurement noise but here because there are other things happening like as the monolayer is kind of crystallizing maybe there's some frustration between the domains uh, but in general as it gets tightly packed it would saturate like so and without getting into the details if we took the full form of this expression and we evaluated it as time gets very large then we would have the relationship that the uh, final fraction occupied is a simple function of the concentration uh, divided by the concentration plus a capital K which is the rate of desorption divided by the rate of adsorption. And what we see in this plot at the bottom right is a plot for the steady state coverage as the pressure or concentration changes. This model assumes a very specific or a very general case where we could be talking about a gas where there's just one gas in the system and we're changing the pressure and that's the concentration or a liquid where we just have this simple, uh, simple case of a, of a single component. And it also assumes there's you know, one step uh, involved in the adsorption and so on. So it's a very simple, mo simple model. But it says that the coverage uh, the steady state coverage increases as the concentration or pressure of our environment increases. And then varying this ratio of the Ka versus Kd, so basically how reversible the interaction between the molecule and the surface is, changes this steady state value at a particular pressure. So you can imagine if we increase the ratio, if we make the molecule stickier, uh, this, might, uh, this would increase, move these curves up, and this can happen uh, by uh, increasing, by decreasing the temperature, so making like thermally activated reversal more likely, and increasing the binding energy. Sorry, this should be increasing uh, uh, and not decreasing. If you have a stronger binding between the molecule and the substrate, then this ratio is going to be higher. So that's just a basic idea of the types of kinetics and trends that would be observed. And if you wanted to have full coverage, you want to, you know, wait for a long enough time and you want to have a sufficient concentration such that the equilibrium uh, loading of molecules on your surface is going to be high. And uh, perhaps you would see trade-offs between the amount of order you would get and, uh, and the uh, eventual steady state coverage that you could achieve. <coughs> and uh, another kind of corollary that doesn't really relate to uh, self-assembly is that uh, if you had, uh, if you took this simple uh, uh, theory and uh, assumed that you had a perfect sticking, so the, the molecules arrived and they stuck, and you were working with a gas uh, under standard conditions, you could derive that the uh, time that it would take a monolayer to form would be very, very, very fast. Uh, and this actually applies, for example, to formation of oxide layers on clean silicon. So uh, as you may know, if you clean a silicon wafer by, say, dipping it in hydrofluoric acid, which etches oxide, and you take it out into the air, uh, often the goal of that uh, etching process is to clean the surface uh, to, uh, to, to remove all the oxide. But it turns out that, in fact, very thin layers of oxides on silicon and on metals form very quickly because of the tendency of the surface to oxidize. And incidentally, some, some measurements done in Stanford's fab a number of years ago, they actually measured the growth rate of SiO2 on a clean silicon wafer as a function of time. Uh, and uh, if you looked at a different version of this plot, you would see that a, a layer uh, of native oxide, something that is less than a nanometer, in fact forms almost instantly. But then due to the characteristics of diffusion-limited growth, uh, it takes several days to even form 
uh, a, uh, a, a layer that's about 10 nanometers thick. So if you have a silicon wafer sitting in ambient, uh, you form uh, at about a 10 nanometer layer of oxide over a very, very long time, but you form the first nanometer within uh, and so often less than a minute or the first few seconds. So uh, it, there are also there are many, you know, many examples of how monolayers form and how they interact with the substrate. And in some cases, uh, you can actually have you know, kind of packing or periodic interactions between your monolayer molecules and your substrate. So there are some cases, for example, in uh, when you have uh, gold uh, and certain thiols that you actually get uh, two-dimensional order of the monolayer with respect to the uh, lattice of the gold. And that's because of essentially the packed lattice constant of the monolayer in two dimensions matching with the arrangement of the gold on the substrate. And as you might imagine, it's also possible to repeat these processes if you repeat them in chemistries that can attach one layer to another. And you can, for example, do this kind of uh, you know, siloxane bonding to uh, a hydroxyl terminated surface and then uh, build one layer and then can do subsequent chemical treatments to stack monolayers one after another after another. And uh, you know, this is kind of a way to start to build a three-dimensional assembly, but in this case, you're just making a silicon-containing organic film. Uh, and this plot shows, with respect to this chemistry, uh, just the thickness of the total film as a function of the number of layers. And the important thing here is just that uh, this trend is roughly linear, so each time you're adding another monolayer on the surface, you're adding a fairly you know, small amount of thickness. And here, you know, these, mo these chains are probably you know, quite long as we think of, of molecules, because after about 20 layers, we have 600 angstroms or 60 nanometers, so it means that each of these is about 3 nanometers in length. So if we think more so in terms of like you know, process control, we can ask what determines the uniformity of uh, uh, an, uh, an order of a self-assembled monolayer. And it's going to depend on you know, how clean and uniform the surface is, how pure uh, the molecule is, and how pure the solution that you're doing the assembly in is, the solvent, and so on. And also, you know, the characteristics of the, uh, the interactions and the amount of time and the conditions you apply. But certainly, you're, you know, less likely to get a highly ordered monolayer if you have a solution that has impure conditions. Or if your chemical synthesis for the amplophiles gives a greater distribution of chain lengths, because then you have locally different interactions depending on what sizes are locally around there. Uh, and it's also, uh, in principle, possible to assemble uh, you know, different types of molecules at the same time. And so there's also a lot of work in, for example, creating you know, mixed monolayers. If you have two different types of amplophiles, both of those interacting well with the gold, then uh, you can, you know, in some cases, get them to separate into domains. And you might have well mixed domains, like generally one molecule of one type next to one of the other type. Or there might be phase segregation based on the interactions of the molecules, kind of like a, a block of polymer generally, uh, with, with, with of the same type being better than interactions of the molecules with a different type. But that's kind of another general tool that's at work uh, when these monolayers are assembled. So we won't have time to go and, and show a lot of how these layers are characterized, but you can just think of uh, characterization techniques for these thin layers being the techniques that we have a general view of already, but with some special attention paid to the fact that you have very thin layers of organic materials typically that are less stable in things like vacuum and under electron beams. So, uh, and also we want to combine, because monolayers are used for uh, often surface modification, uh, our known techniques with things like, for example, measuring the contact angle of a liquid on the surface as an indication of the surface energy of the, of the, of the molecules that are exposed to our environment. So you know, typical ways that monolayers are characterized you know, using 
contact angle measurements to measure the surface energy. There's a technique called ellipsometry, which basically uses a light brought at a grazing incidence to uh, obtain a very precise measure of the thickness. This is used for self-assembled monolayers and very thin polymer films. And if you want to get you know, a really good idea of the morphology of your layer, uh, using STM or AFM is probably the most popular way to do it because then, because these scanning probe techniques can tolerate uh, organic substrates, don't require conductivity, and so on, uh, you can obtain measurements of the texture of the layer, assuming the conditions are not you know, uh, aggressive enough to actually damage the layer. But you can see, for example, grain, grain boundaries and so on. And then it's also possible to use various types of spectroscopy, XPS and infrared spectroscopy to get ideas of the chemical characteristics uh, and also techniques such as plasmon resonance can be used to monitor the kinetics of adsorption in re relating back to the idea that a surface plasmon resonance responds to the dielectric environment. Therefore, if you are looking at the surface plasmon resonance spectrum of a gold surface, as molecules adsorb, you would see a shift in the peak position because the molecules that are sticking are changing the local dielectric constant. If that could be calibrated uh, to the coverage and to the thickness in another experiment, it can be a very precise in situ way to monitor the process conditions. And here is just one example of uh, scanning, tunneling uh, microscope images of uh, the separation of domains in a mixed model layer. So in this case, the researchers were assembling two types of uh, molecules uh, from solution. And I don't know, unfortunately, what these molecules were. But uh, here, uh, because of STM uh, creating different colors based on the different conductivity of the substrate, uh, we can, and this is on a conductive substrate, you can actually use this to distinguish where you have one type of molecule, the blue area, another type of molecule, the light blue area, and in cases where there's no coverage, which I believe is the dark area like so. Uh, but these are the, generally the types of images that would be obtained if you image the, a self-assembled layer on a surface and, and saw the fact that there is this domain segregation happening, whether you had one type of molecule or a second type of molecule. And it's generally uh, very difficult uh, because the monolayers aren't very stable under electron beams uh, to characterize them using electron microscopy. Uh, but it uh, turns out there was a paper just recently uh, that talked about the use of uh, uh, particular conditions and uh, particular uh, grids, in this fact, using graphene as a support material to obtain images of uh, assembled uh, citrate layers. Citrate is just an organic molecule on the surface of a gold nanoparticle. So uh, all I want to say here is that by uh, getting these conditions right and, and by, in fact, subtracting the background from the gold particle and the background uh, intensity from the grid, they were able to get an idea of the uh, vertical packing of multiple monolayers away from the surface of this molecule. And this looks you know, not so perfect, but it's a really outstanding result in terms of the microscopy. And these fringes, kind of like uh, you know, we saw the walls of a single wall nanotube, actually represent uh, subsequent molecular layers assembled on the surface of the gold. And they actually were able to detect the contrast fringes, the oscillating intensity from uh, multiple layers of organic molecules assembled on the surface. And these fringes represent the lattice of the center part, the gold, just taken by doing an intensity scan across the, across the image. <clears throat> OK. So we have about 15 minutes to go. And I'll get started talking about the second method of monolayer assembly, uh, which in some ways builds upon the first method. Uh, and what it's called is, is the langmuir blodgett method, because it was developed at uh, GE, uh, I guess uh, I, I said Bell Labs earlier by mistake, uh, about almost 100 years ago by Irving Langmuir and Catherine Blodgett. And uh, how this process works is uh, it has two main steps. First, you assemble a monolayer of molecules on a liquid surface. Uh, for example, uh, this schematic just shows having uh, a liquid surface like here and taking a drop of 
solution that contains your amplophiles and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and spreading that liquid out on the top surface. So in this case, the amplophiles need to be immiscible in the liquid, meaning they want to assemble on the surface but not go all the way in. Uh, and if, for example, you have an amplophile with a hydrophilic group and a hydrophobic group, and this is a water bath, then you can assemble uh, films uh, on the surface of the water. And then the second step is taking a substrate and drawing it through the surface of the liquid under controlled conditions so you actually pick up the molecule and deposit it on the surface. And if, for example, by deforming the meniscus, you bring the molecule in close contact with the substrate, and by having good interactions between the molecule and the substrate, uh, you can form very well well ordered monolayers by this technique. So you are able you take advantage of the ability to organize films on the surface of a liquid with the ability to mechanically draw the substrate out. And this drawing can be done one time, you know, another time if you're then matching like groups to like groups. And there's a lot of versatility in this as a multi-layer method, just as uh, the formation of self-assembled liars by adsorption is. So uh, uh, along those same lines, you can imagine uh, if you had a water surface and you had uh, amphiphilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic molecules, by doing different combinations of taking your substrate and withdrawing it and immersing it or immersing it and then kind of taking it out uh, in an area where you didn't have molecule on the surface and immersing it again, you could assemble different architectures of these molecules with different groups facing you know, upward or downward. And the blue lines are meant to indicate uh, the breaks between the molecules. And there's a tail-tail you know, uh, interaction here, and a head-head interaction here, and a tail-tail interaction here. And any of these binary combinations can be uh, built by having the same process repeated over again, but changing the direction of immersion and withdrawal. And I guess I should have said this is because uh, the fact that you're immersing it or withdrawing it is going to change the side of the molecule that you pick up on the surface. Because if you imagine you're pushing your substrate down through the top surface of the liquid, then uh, you can uh, bring uh, the up-facing end, uh, the tail or, or, or the head, to, to the surface. And if you're withdrawing it out, then you're deforming the miscus in the other way, and this end of the molecule is sticking to the substrate. And if you've you know, arranged it so what's in contact with the part of the meniscus that you're deforming has a strong interaction, then you basically just pluck the molecule from the surface of the liquid and the process proceeds uh, as desired. <clears throat> so in order for this process to work well, to get a good packing of monolayers on your substrate, you generally need to use an apparatus that uh, gives good packing of the molecules on the surface. Because if you can imagine, if you have a poorly ordered monolayer on the surface of your liquid, then as your substrate gets drawn through, you're going to pick up these poorly ordered molecules, and you're not going to have a well-ordered final film on your substrate. So this is just a general schematic of uh, an apparatus used to, 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 to prepare these monolayers on a surface. And what it does is it has uh, you know, electronics uh, and an actuator that through feedback maintain a constant pressure on the surface. Uh, uh, you might imagine that if you have molecules organized on the surface, if they're compacted uh, closer and closer together, then uh, the, uh, the, you know, the proximity of them to one another would give an increasing surface pressure as they get closer together. And so you use this apparatus to measure the pressure using a very sensitive force center sensor and to actuate the monolayer by compressing it together to maintain a desired constant surface pressure. And then you move the uh, substrate in or out of the solution in the compacted area that has a well-ordered layer. And we'll see how this surface pressure varies in a minute. And it just turns out, uh, just for reference, uh, before Langmuir and Blodgett uh, did this uh, uh, in, uh, say, the 1930s, uh, Agnes Pockels actually published a paper in Nature in 1891 uh, talking about formation of soap films on liquids uh, and, and the effect, the, uh, effect of uh, like the compression of a soap film on this surface pressure uh, and built a trough that was very, very similar indeed to the trough that Langmuir built in uh, the uh, 
uh, in, say, the 1920s, uh, where you know, we didn't have electronics back then, but was just using mechanical apparatus and measurement and uh, movable barriers to control the pressure of the molecules that were up on the surface. So how this is typically done uh, today uh, is using an automated apparatus, and this is one uh, made by KSV that's a company that sells a lot of systems for doing uh, LB Langmuir Blodgett deposition, and, uh, and, and it has a, a bath like so, and it has all the electronics to control the surface pressure as desired, and it typically has a, a, a manipulator that holds a wafer, that's the substrate for deposition. And uh, it can, for example, bring the wafer into solution. And then you, know, you could bring it back out here if you wanted. Or, for example, if you wanted to uh, deposit a second molecule on it, uh, the wafer would be grabbed by the second arm, and it could be you know, brought around to this side, and then it could be passed through the other part of the solution, and this could be repeated. Or if you just wanted to do an you know, A, A, immerse process, it could just pass the wafer down here, and then this would be a place where there's no molecule assembled, and you would just come out with your one A layer on it and go in and get another A layer like so. <clears throat> and uh, kind of in the same vein as with uh, self-assembled monolayers, you can imagine that the compatibility of the molecule to the surface uh, is important for uh, this process as well. And in fact, uh, if you we look in, in more schematic detail at how these molecules behave on the surface. There's kind of an analog to like bonding a monolayer on a solid substrate uh, in, in that if you have a hydrophilic uh, you know, end group uh, on, uh, on your amphiphilic molecule here, uh, the uh, end group that likes the water actually gets pulled down by a very, very small distance beneath the surface. And then if you have many molecules packed, they're just all slightly submerged. But, uh, and this probably pulls like a little bit of the hydrophobic tail down, but the most of the hydrophobic tail is actually sticking above the surface. And uh, uh, in order to you know, have uh, good formation of this monolayer on the liquid surface, you kind of want to you know, balance the strengths of the interactions between the uh, hydrophilic group and the water and the strengths of interactions uh, between the chains. So the, the chemical compositions aren't important here, but for example, if there are no interactions between the end of the molecule and the surface, so in this case, things with hydrocarbon ends that don't uh, interact well with water, then you wouldn't form a uh, film on the surface of the liquid. Uh, if you have cases where you have strongly hydrophilic ends, then you uh, can get a good formation of a layer on the surface. And then in some cases where you have very strong interactions among the chains, then it's not that you won't form a film uh, or that you will form a film, but you might actually get formation of micelles of the molecules on the surface. So certainly design of this uh, layer to this, this molecule to interact appropriately with the liquid surface in a similar way that it would interact, uh, a, 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 say an alkane thiol would interact with gold, is exactly what's going on in the langmuir blodgett case itself. And there are all types of chemical surface treatments that can be used to uh, prepare surfaces to get good adhesion and so on. So you know, here's a bit more about this idea of a surface pressure as you uh, concentrate the molecules on the surface to form a highly ordered layer that's then used for this type of deposition. So imagine uh, now this terminology that this monolayer is like a two-dimensional gas, or it's a bunch of molecules that are being compressed, and as they're being compressed, they're exerting a higher pressure on the mechanism used for compression. And this kind of schematically shows that as the monolayer is compacted, you get higher and higher order. And uh, this uh, shows uh, with just you know, relative numbers for a particular system uh, how the surface pressure or the force that would be needed to compress the layer by this barrier uh, would depend on the area per molecule or the spacing you have between molecules. So in this case, there's more area per molecule, and as this gets compressed or as you add more molecules to the system, then the, uh, the, uh, the area per molecule goes down. And 
of this schematic just use the, 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 the terms loosely calling this a gas and a liquid and that a solid. That's not really what it is, but it means that in this case the molecules are fairly well separated so they're not frequently touching each other. So there's very shallow dependence of the pressure on the area. And once you push the molecules together so they're uh, in better contact with one another, you end up with uh, this kind of solid-like behavior where they start to be tightly packed. And so to de deposit a good monolayer, you want to be up in this regime, but you don't want to press too hard because what's not shown in this plot is once you squeeze too hard, then the monolayer will actually buckle and you'll get layers uh, on top of each other and it will not be a good, be a good situation. So by operating the system in a regime where uh, you characterize this curve to know when you're in the regime of good packing, where there's a, a, a high slope to this pressure versus area, uh, uh, area uh, curve, then that's a typical operating point for depositing good layers. So, you know, in general, because they're, uh, you're, uh, you know, depositing, uh, uh, you know, molecular components, the same types of things as for self-assembled monolayer formation apply to depositing Langmuir-Blodgett films in that you want to have a low vibration environment, you want to have you know, clean air, a hood, uh, clean components, and also very, very high purity uh, molecules. Uh, and also because the uh, impurities or the use of different types of molecules can contaminate the process, you often want to clean your apparatus very well in between uh, steps, say if you did use the same trough, the same system to deposit one molecule and then to deposit another molecule. <clears throat> and uh, these processes, we'll see some examples next time for, uh, for uh, deposition of layer by layer films, some, some some uh, really wide-scale uses like putting things on potato chip bags and helping fruit ripen and things like that. Uh, but, you know, as you would expect in industry, there are continuous systems for depositing these types of films. So this is just a schematic of, uh, if you, of an example system where uh, you, uh, for example, had uh, these rollers instead of a moving barrier to continuously pack a well-ordered layer on the surface. And so uh, here uh, you would be depositing the molecule, and here you would be bringing the substrate out, and these rollers would be used to achieve a multi-stage compaction by essentially directing the number of molecules from one bin to the other. And this is just an example of something that could do this process on more of a continuous uh, basis. And there are likewise other methods of of getting uh, molecules off the surface. And in fact, there's one uh, that's used for kind of uh, printing uh, onto fabrics. Uh, and I think it's uh, well known in some Asian countries. Uh, and the Japanese name, I guess, is suminagashi, which means floating ink. And uh, in this case, you essentially form uh, a monolayer of molecules on a liquid surface. And instead of bringing the substrate out of the surface, uh, it's possible to actually contact print the molecules from the surface to a substrate. And you know, in, in cases in, uh, in which this is more desirable might be a case where, for example, there isn't such good interaction between your substrate and the liquid. Uh, or maybe, uh, for example, you, you wanted to just get a complex like fluid uh, dictated pattern of, of inks on the surface of the liquid and then print it onto a substrate without distorting the pattern by drawing the substrate out of the liquid. So this technique in general of taking advantage of monolayer assembly to form uh, well-packed molecules on solution is, is pretty versatile depending on the details of the molecules and the substrate that you choose. So uh, that's, uh, we've run out of time for today. So then next time I'll just summarize with the two examples that I wanted to show. Uh, in fact, using these similar techniques to organize nanowires on the surface of a, of, a, of, a, of a fluid and to also organize films of graphene and deposit those to make some electronic devices. <laughs>